Is pushing to failure every set the key to muscle growth? Or is it just a fast track way to burn out? Let's break down a new 2024 study that finally gives us some real answers. Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. And today we're unpacking a 2024 study that goes straight to the heart of one of the most debated topics in resistance training. And that is, do you need to train to failure to build muscle or can you leave a rep or two in the tank and still grow just as effectively? This study looked at experienced lifters and directly compared hypertrophy outcomes from training to momentary muscular failure versus stopping at one or two reps in reserve. These findings could have major implications for how you program your training, especially if you're somebody trying to build muscle without burning yourself out. So let's break it down. The idea that training to muscular failure maximizes muscle growth has been around for decades. And I'm at the age where I can actually say that. The logic is pretty simple. The closer you push to the limit, the more motor units you recruit and the more stimulus you give the muscle. But in recent years, the concept of repetitions in reserve has gained serious traction. In fact, many coaches and athletes now use RIR to help guide their training effort, allowing them to stay close to failure without completely hitting the wall. So which is better, training to failure or stopping just a few reps short? Some studies suggest failure training offers a better hypertrophic stimulus, but others argue that it's more fatiguing, potentially reducing training volume, and this may limit long-term muscle growth. So what's the catch? Well, most of that research has been done in untrained people, not experienced lifters. And that's what makes this new study so valuable. The goal of this study was to compare changes in quadricep muscle thickness after eight weeks of resistance training, performed either to failure or with a one two RIR approach in a group of resistance trained men and women. Importantly, the study also tracked neuromuscular fatigue, lifting velocity, and training volume, giving a more complete picture of how each style of training affects muscle growth and performance. So let's take a look at the methods. 18 resistance trained men and women participated in this eight week long within subject design training intervention, during which each individual trained one leg to momentary failure and the contralateral leg using a repetitions in reserve approach, ending the sets with one to two reps in the tank. This within subject design helps control for individual differences in things like genetics, nutrition, and lifestyle. Each participant trained twice a week performing the unilateral leg press and the leg extension. The failure group trained to true momentary muscular failure, while the RIR group stopped at two RIR on the leg press and one RIR on the leg extension. All sets used eight to 12 rep max loads, which is fairly traditional for hypertrophy loading, and the volumes were individualized based on the participant's previous training history. And I'll talk more about this later on. Quadricep muscle thickness, specifically the rectus femoris and vastus lateralis, was measured directly using ultrasound before and after the study. Researchers also tracked lifting velocity and they tracked rep loss from set to set as indicators of neuromuscular fatigue. Now let's take a look at the results. What did the authors find? Well, at the end of eight weeks, both groups experienced very similar increases in muscle thickness. On average, the quadriceps growth was around 0.18 of a centimeter for both the failure and the RIR group. When looking at specific sites of the quads, there were some slight variations. The RIR group had a small growth advantage in the rectus femoris, while the failure group had a slight edge in the vastus lateralis. But these differences were small and likely not practically significant. When it came to training fatigue, the differences were more obvious. The failure group consistently experienced greater decreases in lifting velocity velocity and greater rep loss from their first set to their final set, suggesting more fatigue per session, which is by design and should be expected in my opinion. However, both groups increased fatigue resistance over the course of the eight week study, especially on the leg extension, suggesting that adaptation occurred regardless of how close to failure they trained. Importantly, by the end of the study, both groups ended up doing similar training volume in terms of repetition volume and total load lifted. And this is a key point because it shows that stopping just shy of failure didn't limit the amount of work these lifters were able to complete across the full eight weeks. So what does this all mean? Well, this study reinforces the idea that you don't have to train to failure to build muscle successfully, especially if you're a trained lifter and you're staying within one or two reps of failure. 
leaving a small buffer seems to offer similar hypertrophic benefit with less session to session fatigue, which may help with overall training, sustainability, recovery, and performance. The authors also suggest that failure training might lead to exercise specific fatigue that could interfere with hypertrophy in subsequent exercises. For example, pushing to failure on the leg press may compromise performance in the leg extension, which could explain some of the small muscle specific differences this group of researchers observed. However, it's worth noting that this seems highly speculative given the small degree of difference seen between the two groups. Also, pre-fatigue can and perhaps should be viewed as beneficial, as most advanced training techniques are all seeking to fatigue our muscle in different ways, where if the end result is a fatigued muscle with sufficient volume, it generally tends to grow similarly. These findings align with a growing body of evidence showing that close proximity to failure is key, not failure itself. In practical terms, training to failure might still have a place, particularly in isolation exercises or in advanced training blocks or when training volume is low. But going to failure every set, especially on compound lifts, may just lead to unnecessary fatigue. Now, there is a recent paper that showed that failure may be more important, but only if you are performing one single set of exercise, which makes intuitive sense. But that study saw an overly impressive muscle growth response, a 0.37 centimeter increase in muscle thickness compared to only 0.18 centimeters observed in this study. So I am personally going to refrain from suggesting to you all that training to failure is more important with lower training volumes, at least until there is a replication of this data. Another view might be that the results of this study aren't all that surprising. Most evidence-based hypertrophy guidelines already recommend training to or very near failure to maximize muscle growth. So in a design like this, where both training conditions were taken to either failure or within one or two reps of it, it makes sense that the hypertrophy outcomes were nearly identical. Interestingly, total training volume wasn't different between the condition, which is also important. While volume alone doesn't guarantee muscle growth, the similarity here suggests that there were probably only a few reps difference between the groups across the entire training program. Any differences that did exist would have been small and maybe too small to detect in just eight weeks. And considering the modest sample size of only 18 participants and just 36 legs across three different conditions, this study likely wasn't powered to pick up any subtle changes in muscle growth between the different training styles. So it could be argued that the authors of this paper were trying to detect a difference that simply was too small to pick up over an eight week time frame. Another thing that I haven't discussed yet, which I mentioned at the beginning of the video, is how the researchers prescribed training volume. Instead of giving everybody the same number of sets, volume was based on what participants had been doing before the study, and this creates a ton of variability. For example, participants coming into the study with a low baseline volume, a weekly set number of 12 for the quads, would only need to perform three sets of both the leg press and the leg extension per session given the study's two-week training frequency. Participants coming into the study with a high baseline training volume, such as 30 sets per week for the quadriceps would be performing approximately seven to eight sets for both the leg press and the leg extension per session. Now that's a huge workload and with that many working sets there's a chance that any small differences between training to failure and stopping at two reps in reserve just gets washed out. Basically any differences between failure and non-failure could be diluted by the sheer amount of volume being performed or at least in some of these individuals. So what are my practical takeaways? Takeaways. Well, at the end of the day, this study adds to a growing body of research suggesting that training to muscular failure isn't essential for hypertrophy, as long as you're training within a close proximity to it. Stopping just short of failure, say one or two reps in reserve, can yield comparable results with potentially less fatigue and better recovery. Now that's especially relevant for trained individuals managing high volumes across multiple exercises. Arguably, this may be the smarter approach for individuals in a fat loss phase where recovery is often compromised and the risk of injury tends to increase. And while failure may still have a role, possibly more so in low volume training or when just using isolation movements, it's not a requirement for growth. And in high volume programs, its added fatigue might eventually backfire. 
And of course, it's important to acknowledge this study's limitations, including the small sample size, the short duration, and considerable variability in training volumes. So while we shouldn't overinterpret the results in isolation, when viewed alongside the broader body of research, the takeaway is fairly clear. Training close to failure is not only sufficient for hypertrophy, in some cases it may actually be the more strategic choice. So if you're chasing muscle growth, know that near failure training is enough. You can train hard, recover better, and still make meaningful gains. Now, if this study changed how you think about training intensity, hit that like button, subscribe to my channel for more study breakdowns just like this, and drop me a comment below. Are you team train to failure or are you team repetitions in reserve? Thank you so much for watching. And if you're looking for a new coach or you're in the market for a new evidence-based training program, please head on over to my website by clicking the links in the description below. I'll see you in my next video, guys.